Tom Quee presents The Royal Ramble, an episode-by-episode -episode celebration of the classic British sitcom The Royal Family. To get in touch with the show, email us at theroyalramblepod at gmail.com. Hey everyone, it's Tom Quee here, back with another edition of my Royal Family podcast, The Royal Ramble. If you're not familiar with the show, it's just myself going incredibly in-depth through what I consider, I mean, not just one of the greatest British sitcoms ever, but just one of the greatest pieces of British culture ever, the royal family. And just before we get into the discussion of the episode, we have a little bit of housekeeping to do. As always, if you enjoy the show, there is many ways you can give back to the show, many ways you can support the show. You can, of course, tell a friend, tell a fellow Royal Family obsessive. You can follow us on Twitter at the Royal Ramble Pod. We'll put all the links down below for all this sort of stuff. You can email me, the Royal Ramble Pod at gmail.com. I love to hear from you listeners. And as you know, I've read out many, many great emails as we've gone through these episodes. And I've got a stellar bit of correspondence to get into today as well. You can also go on to iTunes and leave us a review we're on youtube as well and um, the main thing like if you really want to go the next level is our patreon so how that works is you can support the show for a fee and basically you get access to the next episode a month before it drops so i'm always a month ahead of myself on the patreon so in terms of today I've dropped the Christmas episode for people on the free feed, as it were. But on the Patreon today, I've dropped the first episode of Series 3. That's Hello Baby David. So if you just can't get enough of the Royal Family, of the Royal Ramble, and you want to give back, you want to help keep the lights on, the link's down below for the Patreon. And they also put extra stuff up there as well, like you get first listen to the quiz episodes and stuff like that. And I do want to give a huge shout, a huge thanks to two new patrons that we have, Lewis Walker and Paul Cassidy. Thank you so much, guys, for supporting the show. And again, if you do enjoy the show and you want to give back, Patreon is down below. So one final thing, I have a quick email here from Sam and Sam says, Afternoon Tom, hope you're keeping well mate, have you had your tea? I've just listened to your review of Anthony's birthday, which is probably one of my favourite episodes, so it seemed like a good time to get in touch and tell you how much I'm enjoying the podcast. I was about 10 years old when the Royal Family first appeared on telly and have vague memories of being in the living room while my parents were watching it, but I think I was a bit too young to appreciate it at the time. However, when I was around 13, my older sister came home one day with a VHS called The Best of the Royal Family, which contained some of the classic episodes such as The Wedding, Sunday Lunch and The Christening. I remember taking a loan of it and absolutely falling in love with it. I watched it over and over again before seeking out the first three seasons on DVD so I could catch up on what I'd missed. The writing is outstanding, and the show is so brilliantly paced. I can see so much of the characters in my own family. My mum's mum is basically Nana. My dad and her had a love-hate relationship similar to her and Jim. And my own mum comes out with all the bizarre comments and questions that Barbara does, and I see a lot of Denise's lazy-ass selfishness in my sister. For me, one of the best aspects of the show is how sparingly the side characters are used. For instance, we meet Twiggy in the first episode of season one, but we don't see him again until the wedding. But you get the feeling in every episode that he's never far away and could drive drop in at any minute. The same goes for Mary, Joe and Cheryl. They're only next door, but if they were dropping in every episode, then they would lose some of their magic and their irregular appearances keep the whole thing fresh. So keep up the good work, your podcasts are brilliant, and the detail you go into of your research really shows. Maybe see you down the feathers for a point. Cheers, Sam. And Sam, thank you, mate, for that great email. Really appreciate that. And it's so funny that the best of Raw Family keeps coming up. Like That seems to be such a gateway drug for so many people into this show. And I completely agree, too, about the side characters. Like, they never indulged them much, did they? The only one I could think of that they have a bit more regular than the others, and this isn't a bad thing, is Darren. And that's only something that I've realised as I've been getting into Series 3, that Darren, whilst you could never say he's like a main character, like he is in it a fair bit, like he does have a fair few scenes in it and stuff like that, but um, they so skillfully use the ensemble cast whenever they need them. So yeah, thanks again Sam, and if you guys want to get in touch with me, you want to talk about anything Royal Family related, like I love to hear your origin stories like Sam just detailed, or indeed if you've got any thoughts on anything that I've said, or if you disagree with me, if you're counter to some of my interpretations, the Royal Ramble Pod at gmail.com. But that's enough blathering, it's time for the episode, and this is of course the first Christmas special, Christmas with the Royal Family, which was written by Carolyn Ahern, Craig Cash and Carmel Morgan, directed by Steve Benderlach, and it debuted on, of course, the 25th of December, 1999. Okay, and let's get into it. And we have our first Christmas special. I mean, at this point in British culture, the royal family was really was an institution like you know it was one of those shows that they would watch within the show like you know it was in those upper echelons as a uh, eastenders or a uh, changing rooms or antiques roadshow or whatever i mean how traditional how typical how great you know to have a christmas special but obviously in a different very royal mood and you know i find it useful to think of this episode really as
as the conclusion of series two and the final episode that features the amazing Carmel Morgan as writer who has just done fantastic work on this series you know I think everyone can agree that series two is somehow a slight notch up from the genius of season one only slightly mind and that no doubt is down to Carmel as well as Craig Cash and Karen Ahern and loads of other people that I've never mentioned like you know I always find it so interesting on this show when the credits roll to see like you know directors of photography and producers etc and people who have jobs that I'm not really sure what they do but I'm sure they would be important like you know he's like best boy and gaffer and stuff like this so you know it's not all down to Carmel Morgan but still I just want to pay tribute to her basically as we start this episode because I've no doubt that she brought a lot to the table and we begin like the third episode of the show Sunday afternoon began with Barbara the skivvy scraping plates the reality of Christmas day laid bare here, Barbara caustically racking a red-handled knife, scraping the glorious leftovers of crimbo dinner onto another plate. We can see a half-eaten turkey, deprived of much of its flesh and meat with a knife stuck in the middle. There's also other plates beside with further remnants, cracker wrappings and the like. Barbara is happy though, it seems. Tis the season, I suppose. She's singing to herself, rocking a festive red jumper, a Christmas hat also on her head. I'm always jealous of people who can rock the Christmas hat, by the way. Like, I've got a giant head, it's just Tom here, and I can barely fit a cap at its furthest back button in, so a fragile Christmas hat is very far out of reach. Back to the Royal and the kitchen is the kitchen, as I've always known it, but turned up to ten for the Yuletide. It's still chaotic, you know, still with the grease burnt into the wallpaper behind the cooker. And then something new for the show happens as Barbara is singing to herself. The phone rings and someone goes to answer it. I mean, you may recall in the pilot that Jim was lamenting the costs of the phone. It's good to talk my ass, But this is the first time someone's actually called into the Royal Homestead and someone has answered. I mean, yes, technically, at the start of Series 2, Barbara called Norma to tell her the good news of the baby, only to be fobbed off because it's Corrie. But this is slightly different. The exterior world, it seems, at least for a moment, is interacting with the interior of the Royal Domain. So Barbara quickly walks over to the landline, and here we can see a whole plethora of new adornments to the kitchen. There's a popped bottle of bubbly, a small ornament that shows a Santa dragging a large green bauble. Of course, there's an ashtray too on top of the fridge, along with one of those giant bars of dairy milk that everyone seems to have at Christmas. There's also one of those tacky plastic signs on the wall against the wallpaper, this one showing a cartoon Santa with sleigh. I'm pretty sure we used to have one of those in my house when I was younger. Barbara answers the phone, and at first it's unclear who it may be. But, you know, it's Denise, of course. Somewhere elsewhere, for all we know at this point. We don't necessarily know she's in the house. So as Barbara's talking, we can hear the TV, of course, ever-present in the background as this is going on. It's filtering in from the lounge. And Barbara, as she chats, picks up an uninflated balloon and toys with it as she talks, filling Denise in on what's been going on. Oh. 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 Well, your nana's asleep, your dad's being miserable, and Anthony and Dave are watching Noel Edmonds. Yeah. And Noel Edmonds, we'll talk a bit more about Noel Edmonds coming up, but Noel Ernest Edmonds, born in December 1948, is an English television presenter, radio DJ, writer, producer and businessman. Edmonds first became known as a dish jockey on Radio Luxembourg before moving on to BBC Radio 1 in the UK. He has presented various radio shows and light entertainment television programmes across 50 years, originally working for the BBC and later Sky and Channel 4. Obviously his most famous stuff is Multicoloured Swap Shop, who's on Top Gear, the early Top Gear, Telly Addicts, Noel's House Park, Party, and kind of my touchstone for Noel Edmonds when I became aware of Noel it was on those weekdays after school on Channel 4 with Deal or No Deal so Barbara talking to Denise reasons that she's probably just going for a bit of indigestion you know she takes her time with the phone call to Barb really caringly as she always does with everyone really and the chat goes on and then we get to the great reveal at the end of the call yeah are you coming down then yeah I think I will because, of course, Denise was just resting upstairs. I mean, where else would she be at this point? I love this moment, too. And no matter how many times I watch it, it always lands. It's just paced excellently. And we then cut from Barb up to Denise upstairs on the call. And we see another room of the royal household. It's not clear at the moment where it is exactly someone we've seen before or something new. But what is crystal clear is that Denise is still old Denise. I mean, she probably could have shouted down from wherever she was. But she'd rather use the mobile that Dave got off for Christmas. 
And mobiles, I mean, still a major novelty back then. You know, you'll recall that Twiggy mentioned little Lee only talking to him through his mobile as he fucked up the custody because he was bladdered. And, you know, good old Dave, he really does take care of Denise. You know, the washing machine, the mobile, a son. <laughs> you know, he's providing. you got to give him that. And what a waste from Denise, too, though, as well. I mean, perhaps Dave got a contract, but no doubt it's pay-as-you-go. And those minutes really weren't cheap back then. You know, I remember endlessly texting that number that told you what, how much credit you had and all that sort of stuff. Should I come up and get you, Barbara asks, which is sweet. And, you know, to be honest, I do harp on a lot about how lazy and entitled Denise is. But here, her laboured lethargy is fair game. As when we cut upstairs to her again, we can see that she is heavily pregnant, truly preparing herself for motherhood. She's on the cusp, her bump protruding outward as far as her father's own pot belly. And when we head upstairs with these, I believe we're in Jim and Barbara's bedroom, the same one that we saw in the fifth episode of series one, Another Woman. The decor is tired and old-fashioned. There's a shaded lamp at the side, like something out of a tart's boudoir. The mobile phone, too, that Denise hangs up is classic. You know, this is pre-even the dominance of the Nokia days. Rather, it's just a big clunky black thing with the antenna sticking stoutly up. So up Denise rises with some effort, beside her an open box, which could be what the mobile came in, again unclear, and she shuffles across, gasping as she does, probably working the hardest she ever has in her entire life up to this point. And we then cut downstairs into the living room. Dave is struggling, it seems, with some nutcrackers, lots of shells off to his right, piled up on the sofa. Nana is asleep across from him in the same state she was throughout most of Nana Comes to Stay, and she's still got the handbag, but now rocking her pink party hat. Barb then comes into the living room with a big slab of dairy milk, and here we can appreciate that the royals, you know, well, Barbara, no doubt, have gone all out on the Christmas decorations. We can see those paper bells, a Merry Christmas banner, green tinsel framing one of the pictures, Christmas cards stuck up on the wall alongside other paraphernalia. Barb then comments how dead handy it is, the mobile. Dave isn't happy though. They're not cheap them, he says, and we can already see the rot setting in a little with Dave and the way that Craig Cash betrays him. You know, in the sense that he's getting a little stupider each time. Here we can see him with his eyes slightly cockeyed, his voice wavering. Barbara shrugs off Dave's protest though. I mean, it is for the baby, but you know, it's also a present and it's fun to try out. Barb then lights a fag as Jim pops up. Jim who hasn't really featured in this episode much to this point. That's supposed to be for emergencies. When the baby's born. Yeah, they're not cheap, them. How much are they, Dave? 40 notes. Bloody hell. From behind, we can hear Denise coming down the stairs, and as the camera pulls out, we can see Jim at our right side with Nana, Denise and Dave on the sofa, and there's Anthony also in his chair, rocking some sportswear that perhaps he was gifted today. Denise shuffles in laboriously, gets past Anthony and sits down between Dave and Barbara. Anthony gives her this weird look from behind too, kind of up and down, up and down. I mean, it's not like he's kind of confused by his pregnant sister and surveying how different she looks. I'm not really sure what the look means, to be honest. Go back and look at that. Denise settles down. Dave asks if she had a nice sleep. She says she loves the mobile. And he again tells her that it's for emergencies, with Jim again getting his craw in, saying that he bets the calls aren't cheap. And talking of those unsteady on their feet, having a doze, Norma then wakes up. And yes, of course, we've got to have Norma, haven't we? Always a delight to see Liz Smith on screen. And it's perfect raw family as well in its relatability as it just isn't Christmas, is it, without an unwanted elderly relative? Norma claims that the advocate doesn't half make her sleepy. And Norma hasn't been awake five seconds before Jim insults her. Ooh, that advocate doesn't half make me sleepy, Barbara. Mm. Does it? Would you like another one, Norma? (laughs) Though this is funny, you know, asking her as it makes her sleepy if she fancies another. Jim gives his motley chuckle and there's a grand close-up of Norma. Unhappy to hear that. Denise is shown smiling along with Dave. You know, it's classic back and forth, isn't it, this duo? As traditional as mince pies. An advocat, by the way, also known as advocat and borrel, is a traditional Dutch alcoholic beverage made from egg, sugar and brandy. The rich and creamy drink has a smooth custard-like consistency, and the typical ABV content is generally between 14 and 20%, so yeah, I can understand why it might make you sleepy. Barb then asks Anthony what time he's going to Emma's, which places this particular episode, this scene in the episode, at kind of late Christmas afternoon. Anthony, who's rocking the sovereign ring we saw him given in the last episode. Nice touch, that. Where, well, Anthony? Time are you going to Emma's? Well, my mum said five for five thirty, so I think that means about quarter past. Mm. Five for five thirty. 
What a perfect way to further separate Emma's family from the royals. You know, like the BMW and the four-wheel drive and all the other future things we'll learn about in the next Christmas special. Saying 5 for 5.30, it's just, you know, it's such a dividing line, isn't it? It's such a middle-class thing to say. Obviously, it just means arrive around this time. But expressing it in such a way places them in a different social strata altogether. I'm sure Barb has never told Jim when he's at the pub to get home for 1 for one thirty for Sunday lunch, you know. So Barbara listens, holds her long burnt cigarette up, and then says how funny it is that Anthony is going to have two Sunday dinners. Again, another sign of the difference between these clans, the fact that they have their Sunday roast so much later than the royals. The dinner is going to be different for a few reasons, though, not least because it will be vegetarian, as Emma's family, like herself, are all vegetarian, and they're having a nut roast, something that stuns the royals even further. I mean, remember Emma and the wafer Finn ham incident... <laughs> This is way worse. Denise smiles to herself for a second and then looks at Dave in disbelief. A nut roast. And what is a nut roast? Well, a nut roast or roasted nut loaf is a vegetarian dish consisted of nuts, grains, vegetable oils, broth or butter and seasonings formed into a firm loaf shape or long casserole dish before roasting and often eaten as an alternative to a traditional British style roast dinner. Nut roasts are also made by Canadian and American vegetarians and vegans as the main dish for Thanksgiving or other harvest festival meals. Jim just doesn't get it calls Roger, who is Emma's dad, but who's actually unnamed at this point, but, you know, we'll be calling him Roger as we go through, and can't wait to meet him, played by the genius that is John Henshaw, aka Ken from Early Doors. He calls Roger a tight get, not git, great dialect. He's got all the money and won't fork out for turkey. Well, no, of course he won't. I mean, he doesn't want turkey, you know, on moral grounds rather than financial, I'm sure. And when we cut to Jim here too, we can see that he's made a slight effort for Christmas. Not just rocking the paper hat, but also a cardigan that is the same sickly yellow as his traditional garb. And I love that when Jim says this ignorant comment, Anthony just looks at him wearily, like I can even detect some pity in there as well. This progressive approach to Christmas doesn't sit well with Norma. She can't believe they're having their Christmas dinner at night, saying it will lay heavy on them, won't it? Which is such a nan thing to say. I mean, kind of true. I mean, it's probably lighter about the roasted meats and such, but Nana has focused on this before, this idea of heavy meats and stuff like that. Like, you remember in the Sunday dinner episode, she talks about something sticking to a palate, not having too much meat, you know? So Barbara asks Anthony if he's going to stay late. He says yeah, and then is hesitant with the next part. I mean, great acting from Ralph Little here. He deals with it perfectly as... You know, Anthony's a smart kid, and he knows that the next thing he's going to say is going to cause a right ruckus. But he's an honest lad. The Will you be staying late, Anthony? Because yeah. Well, after they've had the dinner, they always play charades, you know, and parlour games and that. Parlour <laughs> games! <laughs> 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 The telly broke. <laughs> and as always with the royal family, the jokes are so layered. Like, of course, I guess, yes, it's funny on a certain level. The idea of slightly retiring Wallflower Anthony playing parlour games with that lot. But the royals here are laughing at the very idea of doing that. But of course, the joke is really on them, that they look down on something that's actually quite fun. And besides, I've always thought this joke has another level as well, because, yeah, maybe the royals wouldn't do parlour games or something like that, but they look love a sing-song. They love a dance. You know, we, we, we've seen this many times in the show so far. So they're not kind of like, you know, they're not quite retiring people themselves. It's not too far removed from parlour games to, to sing some George Formby or whatever, you know. And charades and parlour games, well, charades, which is a parlour game or party word guessing game. Originally, the game was a dramatic form of literary charades, where a single person would act out each syllable of a word or phrase in order, followed by the whole phrase together while the rest of the group guessed. In the early 19th century, the French began performing acting or acted charades, with the written description being replaced by dramatic performances as a parlour game. And this was then brought over to Britain by the English aristocracy. Thus then, the term charades became more popularly used to refer to acted charades, examples of which are described in Vanity Fair by William Thackeray, and Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre. And Parlour Games is a great Wikipedia page on all these different Parlour Games out there. Obviously, Charades is one. Like, loads of these I've never heard of. Hockle Buckle Beanstalk. Are You There, Moriarty is another one. Carnelli. Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. I mean, you can kind of work that one out. The Minister's Cat. Wink Murder. Like, some of these I've played, but some of these I might need to check out. 
So regardless of the inferences of them playing charades and any sort of guarded judgment there, it's great to see everyone having a good laugh together. Denise asks if the telly is broke, which is a nice follow-up, and kind of the only possible reason she can conceive that they'd be engaging in charades out of their free will, perhaps. Everyone cracks up again at this, the camera swings to Jim laughing in his seat, you know, and at this point too we get our first proper view of the coffee table, which is laden with chocolates and treats, just as any self-respecting table should be on the day of Kris Kringle. We can see bowls of nibbles and nuts, along with those seriously giant tins back in the day of Quality Street celebrations and roses, atop which is the dairy milk slab, which we've seen earlier. And I don't want to hark back to in my day kind of thing, you know, I mean, I was born in 92, so I'm not that old, I guess, in the scheme of things, but, you know, call it Brexit, call it shrinkflation, call it whatever, but these size tins don't exist anymore. You know, it's funny, really, because I was making my notes for this episode at Christmas, pretty much, so, you know, a little bit annoying that I couldn't get it out at that time, but whatever, but it was intriguing to compare, you know, seeing these giant chocolate tins and seeing what they sell in Tesco nowadays, they don't, you know, they're not similar, like, they're just not, like, you know, everything's been reduced. They used to be gargantuan, and now they're just bobbins. Ah, the 90s. And let's just focus on those chocolates quickly. So, Cadbury Roses are a selection of machine wrap chocolates made by Cadbury, introduced in the UK in 1938. They were thought to be named after the English packaging equipment company Rose Brothers, which were based in Gainsborough, Lincolnshire, that manufactured and supplied the machines that wrapped the chocolates. By 2020, though, an alternative origin of the name was given in a text panel printed on the side of tubs of roses. It notes that they were named after the favourite flowers of Dorothy Cadbury, a director of the company and renowned botanist, which grew in the gardens of the original factory at Bourneville. And Quality Street. Quality Street is the brand name for a selection of individual tinned or box toffee chocolates and sweets, first manufactured by Macintoshes in Halifax, West Yorkshire in 1936. It was named after J.M. Barry's play Quality Street, and today they are produced by Nestle. Now, I found this really interesting because obviously J.M. Barry today is like the author of Peter Pan, kind of had this really weird history with lots of young boys going off to war and stuff like definitely worth reading further on if you're into that sort of stuff but um but yeah how funny is that no one remembers that quality street play at all but it was so popular back then you know originally on the packaging they would have characters from the play on the advertising and such and this is crazy as well. Quality Street gained the implied endorsement of Saddam Hussein when the Iraqi leader was reported to have offered them to visiting British politician George Galloway in 2002. Nestle were initially positive, but then chose to backtrack about the connection. And finally, we have Celebrations. Celebrations being a miniature chocolate bar collection made by Mars Incorporated and launched in 1997. And it's funny, really, because like, I obviously remember all these from my youth, but I find it interesting that they don't have a box of heroes or miniature heroes, which is like Cadbury's answer to Celebrations on the table. But from what I can work out, those were introduced in September 1999. So probably at the time of them filming this, they weren't out yet. But yeah, I mean, you know, we're a small nation over here, but chocolate-wise, I think we punch above our weight. So everyone's laughing, Anthony sarcastically titters along, knowing probably that he's actually going to have a ton of fun over there with Emma and Roger and the like, as the Royals watch the same old crap on telly. Jim naturally says, parlor games my ass," and then offers up something that Anthony might be good at. Parlor games my ass. Hey, I tell you what you'd be good at, that's if they play it. Hunt the gyro. <laughs> <laughs> Gyro, of course, being like, you know, the form of payment for the benefit check of sorts, as it were, which, as always with Jim, is rich, uh, pun not intended, as he's on the gyro, I bet. It's not made clear here, but it is said explicitly in Queen of Sheba. Anthony chuckles ironically further, not happy, you know, having opened up about his plans and then being struck down for them. Everyone laughs again and he seethes a little, quite rightly. You know, it doesn't sound too bad, though, to Barb to go over there. She says that they could play some sort of game. Then recollects a Christmas bygone where they were trying to play rummy, and Nana had two kings and a handbag. She says that she didn't know they were there, Barbara, the way she says that's great. And the way she laughs as well is classic Nana. They did come in handy, though, for the royal flush, she says. And I mean, <laughs> better that royal flush than a bloody gym royal flush. And Nana sticks her tongue out to Jim there when she says that, claiming that she won £13 that night. I wonder when that was. Pre-Dave, maybe? I mean, you know, it's kind of one of those stories they clearly have a lot of fun revisiting. And Rummy, Rummy being a group of matching card games notable for similar gameplay based on matching cards of the same rank or sequence and same suit. The basic goal in any form of Rummy is to build melds, which can be either sets, three or four of a kind of the same rank, or runs, three or more sequential cards of the same suit. If a player discards a card, making a run in the discard pile, it may not be taken up without taking all the cards below the top one. Several theories about the origin of the name Rummy exist. Some attribute it to the British slang word rum, meaning odd, strange, or queer. 
Others say the origin lies in the game Rum Poker, or in the popular liquor of the same name. And as much as Anthony has got pelters just now, Jimmy's getting it back over the rummy. Barbara asks Jim if that was the Christmas he didn't sleep, and everyone just howls at him, Jim unamused. Again, testament to Jim's miserly side. I mean, losing £13 and losing sleep over it. That's our Jim. Anthony seems to laugh particularly loudly here, and we've seen that a few times in the show, haven't we? When someone insults Jim and Anthony feels he's getting his own back somewhat through that vicariously. And Jim, again, you know, he can be really self-aware and perceptive at times, but he can also be very close-minded and ignorant. He doesn't understand why Anthony would want to go round there, says Parla Games My Arse again. He doesn't understand because he could be around here watching the box of his family. They need to get out more, them lot, he says. And this is coming from the man we haven't seen leave the house now for 12 episodes and counting. And as this is going on, Noel Edmonds can be heard to talk as Dave asks Denise what time they're going round to his parents. She says she doesn't want to go, really, which is kind of fair. I mean, she is very heavily pregnant. I mean, if there was ever a valid excuse for Denise's inertness, then this is it. Dave is a little irked, though. It's only him and Denise going for the turkey buffet. And if she doesn't go, it'll just be him and his parents. And his dad, Limp Along Leslie, apparently goes to bed early. Denise says she feels a bit funny, and yeah, from her lounging position, she does look fit to burst. Barbara looks to Denise here, worried as she says that. Nana beside seems to have fallen back asleep, and Dave huffs and puffs in dismay. Jim then, who himself on a meta level is starring in a programme that is put on at Christmas, decries the quality of programming put on at Christmas. This is the one day of the year we all get together to watch the bloody television and look at this shite they put on. Well, let's go on for the baton. <sighs> Oh, get off, Jim. The delicious irony there. Yeah, the one day they all watch TV together. Going for a burden, Jim says as well, which is a great old school phrase. And he switches over the TV, much to Barb and Norma's dismay. We can hear on the TV the piano tinkling of the snowman. I mean, what a Christmas classic. It's playing underneath as Nana says, I like him. Which again, is such a Nana thing to say when something is turned over. Not, I like that program, but I like him. I mean, Nana, you'll remember, has said she likes Hugh Scully in the past on Antiques roadshow and nana calls noel edmonds noel crinkly bottom like she called the virgin entrepreneur richard branston and smiles at his nana's malaprop squidges his nose a bit as he watches the box and the camera then cuts directly to it to the tv and we can see here that even the sacred television in the royal household has been given the festive treatment as it too has been gifted a tinsel frame and crinkly bottom why does nana say crinkly bottom i didn't realize this i mean as i said before my noel edmunds knowledge is kind of deal or no deal kind of vibe well crinkly bottom also referred to as blobby land was the operating title for a series of british theme parks operating in the 1990s they were created by noel edmunds based on the fictional village of crinkly bottom where the noel's house party tv program was based the parks operated on the popularity of mr blobby three parks were operated under the crinkly bottom name in england by edmunds company unique however all of the parks eventually failed and were either closed or rebranded and if anyone out there is into urban exploration i mean there's so many great videos of people breaking into like closed florida theme parks and stuff like that there is an absolute glut of stuff on crinkly bottom theme parks in england and um quite haunting there's a nice shot here then of everyone watching the tv barbara lovingly stroking her daughter's tummy and really it's not long at all until she becomes a grandmother has another baby to continue raising in a way and the song on the tv is particularly loud here far more than usual. It's not background, it's more of a soundtrack, regal and marching. Barbara asks Jim if he liked the turkey, to which he grimaces somewhat. All the chocolate boxes we can see are now clear in front of his throne. It's a little bit dry, weren't it, Barbie says, and Nana says she never liked turkey. And I do think, why do people go for turkey in this situation? It's tradition, I suppose, but turkey will always be one of the lower down meats for me personally, far below chicken beef or even a bit of the old gamo. And what about the history of turkey at Christmas? Well, in England, the evolution of the main course into turkey did not take place for years, even centuries. At first, in medieval England, a main course of boar was sometimes served. And through the 16th and 17th century, it was goose or capon that was commonly served. And the rich sometimes dined upon peacock and swan. The turkey appeared on Christmas tables first in England in the 16th century, and popular history tells of King Henry VIII being the first English monarch to have turkey for Christmas. The 16th century farmer Thomas Tusser noted that by 1573, turkeys were commonly served at English Christmas dinners. The tradition of turkey at Christmas rapidly spread throughout England in the 17th century, and it also became common to serve goose, which remained the predominant roast until the Victorian era. Indeed, it was quite common for goose clubs to be set up, allowing working class families to save up over the year towards a goose. So no one seems to have enjoyed the turkey. Dave says he could take it or leave it, despite stating that his mom's put on a buffet of the stuff at hers later on, and Denise is just straight with it. 
no, I didn't like it. There's no flavour. I mean, poor Bob. Anthony isn't bothered either, giving the non-committal answer that it's a standard of a teenager. I mean, she went to all this trouble, Bob, and no one appreciated it. How typical. Someone could have lied, what with it being Christmas and all the spirit and that. And again, too, as I mentioned many times on the show, I love the shots where characters are close together and overlap. So, as we hear Bob, so as Barb is hearing all this feedback in her green Christmas hat, we have a slice of Nana next to her, absently watching with her pink one on. And hearing all these opinions on the turkey then, Barb decides that maybe she won't bother next year, to which everyone acts up against in unison. Oh, I don't think I'll bother getting the turkey next Christmas. Oh, 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 hi, bro. Oh. Christmas. Love that. Classic bit of raw family undermining expectations there. Jim, King Killjoy himself, asking Barb not to be one. Anthony almost gets out of his seat in shock and then retreats back as Barb talks about them all making a get a Christmas pudding despite not having any. And Christmas pudding, well, Christmas pudding is a sweet dried fruit pudding traditionally served as part of Christmas dinner in Britain, Ireland and other countries to which the tradition has been exported. It has its origins in medieval England, with early recipes making use of dried fruit, flour, eggs and spices, along with liquids such as milk or fortified wine. So Barbara sits for a second, watches what's in front of her, then wonders aloud how Cheryl from next door has got on, laughing to herself as she does. Mary, we learn, has had to cook her a Weight Watchers low-fat Christmas dinner. I mean, Christ, there's an oxymoron. But good on old Mary for helping out. You know, I'm sure Jim hasn't lifted a finger or, indeed, uttered a word. We also hear that Cheryl has met someone at Weight Watchers. Not a love interest, but someone who can seemingly make her look better in comparison. Kind of like what Cheryl does for Denise, as Anthony pointed out in the first episode. Oh, oh. Mary says Cheryl's met a lovely new friend at Weight Watchers. Has she? Yeah, a big fat girl from Hyde. Oh. Oh, I like the sound of that. The big bride from Hyde. (laughs) <laughs> Hyde being a town in Tameside, Greater Manchester, England Which had a population of 34,000 in 2011 Lots of famous people from Hyde I mean, L.S. Lowry, who's an unbelievable artist from Salford Hailing But also a lot of horrific murderers as well Harold Shipman, Ian Brady and Myra Hindley all come from Hyde So Jim clowns on the big bride from Hyde Get some laughs And Barb then, it seems she just can't stay still Says that everyone should have a snowball as they make you feel Christmassy Snowball my ass, Jim retorts. It's a bloody swizz this Christmas lark. Because, I mean, it's Jim, isn't it? So he's going to say this. Anthony at this point can be seen picking his teeth. Kind of like his father, but more dignified in that manner. Nana then asked Denise what the book she bought Cheryl was about. Which is nice that she got her a gift. It's Feng Shui, Denise says. Which she has mentioned before in the Sunday dinner episode with talk of Dave's moped. The old fizzy, you know, that was messing with the Feng Shui. And Feng Shui obviously isn't something Nana is familiar with. Calls it Feng Dewey for one. But yeah, that's Nana speak, ain't it? Denise explains it's about moving things around the house to bring you happiness. And Jim sees an opportunity there and just has to go in for another dig. What's Feng Dewey? Well, it's where you move everything around in your house, you know, to bring you happiness. Ooh. I'd only have to move one thing in this house to make me happy. <laughs> 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 he doesn't even have to develop it further than that Nana shoots a side eye glance And man it's hilarious The dismissive way that he looks at her It's so loaded You know Denise burbles laughter Nana just looks aggrieved I mean she was only just trying to enlighten herself About some eastern enlightenment techniques And here comes Jim Crapping all over it Nana looks at Dave and Denise Who are essentially laughing at her And glances across from his chair Smiles but doesn't want to be too obvious about it like And it really seems to be on the TV some old shite, as Jim has said. The music continues, and we quickly get a shot of Snowman and Santa slowly dancing together. Denise then continues to Fred with Nana, informs her that Cheryl got her a birthing tape, one she's put all her favourite songs on to help relax the baby. I mean, what a thoughtful gesture. Cheryl is lovely, you know, similar to Mary in her considerate nature, really. And I wonder what the full playlist is. It's a nice late 90s gift too, as soon enough you would just burn a CD, you know, in the early 2000s, and nowadays you just make a blummin' Spotify playlist. But good on Chezza, aura and all. But of course no good deed goes uninsulted, as we always learn in this show. A critic leaves no turn unstoned and all that. And Nana, she doesn't really reflect on the birthing tape gift at all. Well, she's put all my favourite songs on one tape, because it's said in the baby book, you know, that it'll relax you, you know, for when you're birthing. She's a right big girl, is Cheryl, isn't she? What a switch! 
rough too. Jim doesn't even pile on, and normally that's a red rag to O'Reilly's ball, as Cheryl has been referred to in the past. So in comes Barb with the snowballs as some rumper pump melody sounds out on the TV. I do really like the decision here to increase the volume on the TV, as it's far louder in the background than we ever encountered it. Gives the episode a different feel, you know? We then get a new shot from behind, and we can see that there's more Christmas decorations about. Tinsel hanging in laurels above the fireplace, a, a line of cards above the mantle amongst other knickknacks. The drinks get dished out, Barbara places Denise's on the bump, everyone lies back, sips, and Norma then says it always reminds her of Barb's dad, to which Jim says, here we go again. He always used to make her one, Norma says, as she then looks at her glass, and says that she always misses him more at Christmas. She doesn't know why. Well, I mean, we all miss our loved ones more at Christmas, don't we? There's no mystery behind that, you know. Poor Norma, however. She seems on the verge of full-blown tears, and she can be heard mewling slightly. Barb, though, to her credit, doesn't allow her to get her talons into the mood of the evening. She turns her back on her and encourages a toast with the fresh snowballs. Everyone toasts. Norma, still despondent in manner, goes to toast with Jim, and he goes to toast with her, what with them being closest to each other, but neither goes through with it. Man, they really are in quite a hostile place at the moment. And what is a snowball? Well, a snowball is a mixture of Advocat, which we established earlier, and carbonated lemonade in approximately equal parts. It may have other ingredients to taste. It typically contains a squeeze of fresh lime juice, which is shaken with the Advocat, before pouring into a glass and topping up with lemonade. In the UK, it is often sold in pubs and supermarkets in small bottles, and is usually drunk as a winter warmer. So not getting anything from Jim, Norma waits for Barb then for a toast and chinks. Aunt absently chinks Dave and they all drink. Norma downing hers with real force, then wiping her mouth twice, supping like a sailor and smiling groggily to her daughter with red cheek satisfaction. Bloody hell! <laughs> Bloody hell, Jim utters, and yeah, rightly so. Nana is quite the drinker, as we've established, and the chink of the glasses had barely stopped sounding before she was glugging it all in one. Jim takes a hearty sip, and we can see some in his beard. Barbara really enjoys hers, looks at the glass, closes her eyes in tranquil delight, savouring the feeling of Christmas that the drink really seems to hold for her. And I mean... Should Denise really be drinking this, you know, what with the brandy and stuff? I mean, go check out the Sunday dinner episode for a discussion of the effects of alcohol on a newborn after all. But, you know, I guess Barb drank whilst pregnant with Anton Denise and there was apparently no harm there. So, um, yeah, I love that they show that, though. I love that they show her disregard, even at this point of the pregnancy. I mean, she's going to give birth in a few hours and here she is having a cocktail. And then there's another topic that really puts this episode in a time and place. Barbara asked Denise about the millennium and their plans. Denise says they laboured long and hard, but eventually just decided to come round to theirs. <laughs> Sounds like a right party too they're going to have at the Royals. Buffet, Joe, Mary and Cheryl invited. And I really wish we got this episode too as a special. You know, I suppose as the Royal Family is in real time, they'd have to start the Millennium episode around 11.30, what with the countdown to the new year and stuff. But I know they'd done a Christmas special and then they had Series 3 coming up. And maybe it'd be a bit overkill to do two over the holidays. What, especially with Denise giving birth and it would be dominant by that but yeah I just like to imagine a millennium episode what it would be I guess people would be far drunker than usual you know I, I, I don't know I just want as much classic era of the show as possible I suppose and what is the millennium or amillennium well amillennium is a period of 1000 years sometimes called a kilo annum or kilo year sometimes the word is used specifically for periods of a thousand years that begin at the starting point of the calendar in consideration and at later years there are a whole number of multiples of thousand year dates after the start point the term can also refer to an interval of time beginning on any date millennia sometimes have religious or theological implications and what about the uk millennium like i'm sure you guys listening remember the millennium i mean i was born in 92 so i would have been eight when the millennium happened and i think it was the first time and a lot of my friends have said the same thing as well it was the first time our parents let us stay up late, you know, and I'm pretty sure I, like, was asleep and then woke to a bit of fireworks or something. I don't really remember it, you know, but um, I'm sure many of you do. And what happened in the UK? Well, apparently in London, attention focused around Big Ben as well as the opening of the Millennium Dome. And there was a huge fireworks display called the River of Fire that went along four miles of the River Thames. In Ireland, the Irish National Radio and Television Organisation, RTE, produced a marathon 19-hour broadcast called Millennium Eve Celebrate 2000, while the BBC 
BBC in the UK headed an international 28 hour event known as 2000 Today. And just recording this now, I've realised that there is a kind of millennium episode of a classic British sitcom in the like of Royal Family, This Country, which I regard as just as good as the Royal Family. And they have a flashback to a millennium party where Curtin and Kerry are pretty much the age I was and they're playing PlayStation, they're playing Crash Bandicoot, no less. So yeah, just wonderful. Jim then states that he doesn't want Cheryl's mate round for the millennium as there'd be no buffet left. The big, fat, lazy heifer. I mean, Jim doesn't even know this person. Never knew she existed until five minutes ago and is already insulting her, imagining that she'd be stealing food from him. Another big, lazy heifer indeed. And heifer, well, that's a young female before she's had a calf of her own and who is under three years old. A young female that has had only one calf is occasionally called a first calf heifer. Mary's really looking forward to the party, though, we hear, but Joe just can't get excited about Millennium. And Jim lays his cards on the table. He's going to be doing him, Millennium or not. <laughs> millennium, my heart, it's just another bloody swift they've come up with to bloody rip me off, isn't it? Well, I'm going to treat it like any other New Year's Eve, mate. That's it, I'm going to get totally bladdered, and I'm doing nothing else. That's it, I'm doing nothing else. He can take it or leave it. Who can, Dad? Tony bloody Blair and his shower who bloody organised it. It's just a con to get more money out of me. There's another marker of time too. Tony Blair, who was the Prime Minister at the time. And it's just a con, Jim. I mean, you're not doing anything different. So how is it a con? I mean, to quote Barbara, oh, you are a miserable sod, you, Jim Royal. You know, um, she probably said that in many episodes. And Tony Blair. Sir Anthony Charles Lytton Blair, born in May 1953, is a British politician who served as Prime Minister of the UK from 97 to 2007 and leader of the Labour Party from 94 to 2007. As a Prime Minister, many of his policies reflected a centrist third-way political philosophy. He is the only living former Labour leader to have led the party to a general election victory, and one of only two in history, the other being Harold Wilson, to form three majority governments. Perhaps Jim isn't all too happy about it, though, the millennium, as Norma is stopping over for the Manellium, as she calls it. And we've had a few normerisms this episode, haven't we? Manellium, Feng Dewey, Noel Crinklebottom, the whole lot. Barbara laughs at this mistake and says, of course, Nana wouldn't want to miss it, she says, but you imagine she'll be asleep by the time the countdown is bonging. And Jim is just on the attack in this episode. When Nana says she doesn't want to miss it, Jim asks her what the last one was like and explodes in laughter. And Ricky is so infectious in this mini storm of riotous wheezing here. Dave smiles, Denise laughs, but Norma is entirely unimpressed. And Barbara just kind of looks, just kind of looks really, not surprised, you know, just kind of gazes. And is also shown to be smiling heartily at this. And the implication, of course, being that Norma is more than 2,000 years old. On stage, on the TV, is a live rendition of the snowman as it continues. And we can see the young boy and the snowman himself rise into flight as that haunting song sounds out. Denise then feels a sudden kick. Asks her husband, the soon-to-be first-time father, if he wants to feel it, and he says, nah, you're all right. Denise looks hurt by this, really hurt, and rightly so. I mean, soon enough the roles are going to be completely reversed, with her not giving a shit and him doing all the heavy lifting. But still, it's not very husbandly or humanistic on his part there, Dave. You know, consider all the mobile aggro he's been giving her as well. So Barbara's gotten snowballs. She's fetched chocolate in. And now she's asking if anyone fancies a sandwich. I mean, this is all in like a 20-minute span, you know. Dave asks what's on it. I mean, it's turkey, obviously. And then he replies, no thanks, kind of absently. Barbara still wants to talk food, though, and tells Denise, who really couldn't care less, I mean, Denise, who's clogged with a Christmas dinner and a baby at the moment, that the stuffing was a recipe from this morning. Though she lacked the ingredients proper, so she mixed it with a bit of Paxo. Paxo, of course, is a brand of stuffing in the UK, currently owned by Premier Foods. It was devised in 1901 by John Crampton, a butcher from Eccles near Manchester. So it's, it's a local delicacy for the royals then. In the beginning, sales growth of Paxo was slow because stuffing was mainly served with chickens and poultry, which was then regarded as a luxury. But as the price of chickens dropped and that of red meats rose in the 50s and 60s, Paxo's popularity grew. And at Christmas, the product is advertised with the slogan, Christmas wouldn't be Christmas without the Paxo. Barbara then ruminates on the whole transience of the holiday feast. Ooh, you work so hard on that Christmas dinner. You're planning it for weeks. Before you know it, it's all been eaten. Denise asks about the washing up, which is odd because why would she care? Barb says that as Nana isn't staying, she'll do it tonight. The kitchen is like Beirut, which is a comparison that Barbara seems oddly fond of. And I love this in the royal family. Like, they really capture people who have these sort of common point references, you know, because Barbara has said Beirut before, which is such a weird thing to say, Beirut, like that, Beirut. 
it's kind of like an odd country for her to reference, you know, just as a kind of um, metonymy for chaos, you know. But you may recall that when she's speaking about Dave taking Nana back to the flats after Antiques Rojo, it's like, beer root round, she says. That's a terrible accent on my part. Elsie then gets another mention as Norma is visiting her tonight, and Denise asks what time she has to be there. What time do you have to be at Elsie's? Oh, well, I don't want to be late, Denise. Elsie goes to bed early, you know, with being housebound. Right. It's the first time her daughter's ever left her at Christmas. Oh. South Africa they're going to. Ooh. Cape Town. It's the first time her daughter, who we later learn is called Marion, has left her at Christmas. They're off to South Africa, Cape Town, with all the stuff from M&S. And Cape Town is the oldest and second largest city in South America after Johannesburg, and also the seat of the Parliament of South Africa. In 2014, Cape Town was named the best place in the world to visit by both the New York Times and the Daily Telegraph. Norma, ever the twin of Jim, burps herself. That advocate from the snowball no doubt doing its work. And lots of people are doing that now, Barb says going away for Christmas. And the shot here, the directorial choice, is stupendous. It's a typically terrific tableau of the four of them, all sitting beside each other. Barb says she couldn't do it, though. Go away. Jim says he could. I mean, who'd be paying for that, though, Jim? Jim wants to get away because Christmas is a swizz, which, yes, Jim, we've heard you. I mean, he must be like this every single year. I mean, he is like this every single year, isn't he? Barbara then asks what Norma got Elsie for Christmas, and it turns out that Norma re-gifted the blue cardigan that she never liked on her. I mean, I bet it wasn't pristine either. I bet she'd worn it a few times. So she gave Elsie that. So I think that Barbara reveals to Denise that she bought for her mother, but of course, Norma is a tad too self-absorbed to be cognizant of a little fact like that. So Norma doesn't hear this looks on stoutly. Barbara shoots her a slightly annoyed glance, but of course, it doesn't matter. Norma doesn't care, isn't bothered that she didn't put an iota of effort into poor housebound Elsie's present. And then, out of nowhere, Jim returns to phone bills, stating that it's also expensive to ring someone on one of them as well as to ring from them, so don't expect them to ring them back on that. There are for emergencies them, Dave is at pains to tell Denise, at pains seemingly to talk too. He seems groggy and stupefied. Poor Denise. I mean, she really has been getting it a bit in the neck here, all episode, over the mobile and such, and obviously internally. Barb, though, is quick to mollify the situation. Reminds them it's Christmas Day, that they're having their snowballs. Well, most of them are. Nana, of course, has already supped hers dry. Anthony then tries to get the conversation going. Not bragging on behalf of Emma's parents, I think, but just illuminating further their exotic world. Hey, you know Emma's mum and dad? Mm-hmm. They've got a widescreen, Sally. <gasps> Have the Yeah. And it's got a, like, panoramic sound. It's top. Oh. Panoramic sound on it, and they're playing all them stupid bloody parlour games. He must have money to burn him. Jim sounds interested at first, and instantly gets miserly. Interesting, really, as back then everyone was rocking the CRTs with the big backs, but now you can get a great widescreen TV with panoramic sound for pretty cheap, really. You know, not, not for much money at all. And shakes his head. Norma ums along in agreement as Barb simply says, widescreen telly. You know, and compared to the Royals TV, I mean, can you imagine the sort of things they watch on a proper widescreen? They could watch a movie, maybe, like Tattoo, or maybe some sport, but no, Barbara has different plans. Do you know, Denise, I'd love to watch your wedding video on a widescreen oh, telly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I would. I really, really would. That video again. God, I wish I could watch it. Got me thinking too about the props used in the show, like the TV they watch. I wonder where that is now. Like, that should be in a museum. Like, that should be in, like, Manchester's Town Hall Museum or the Museum of TV History. You know what I mean? I I would love to have an ornament from that living room. I mean, wouldn't you too? Nana's seen that video so many times, I'm sure, but she'd be down to watch it again in the flash, no doubt. Denise declared that she'd love it too. Jim, though, despite sounding quite enthusiastic towards the idea of a TV a moment ago, now claims that you're seeing the same shite but wider, which... I guess it's kind of fair. And the show, at this point, the Royal Family, had become very comfortable with playing with the concept of reality. I mean, recalling Anthony's birthday, the last episode we discussed, when the Fast Show is mentioned, a programme that in real life, Craig and Carolyn Ahern were part of. I mean, Carolyn Ahern's on screen in that show. And here, Nana asks, what time is Dibley on? She says, I do like that big funny girl, the one that dresses up as the vicar. 
But of course, I mean, I'm sure many of you who watch Vicar Dibley know this already, Liz Smith, aka Norma, is part of the main cast of the damn show! I mean, amazing. I love that this again, that knowing wink to the audience is sublime. Not only are they trying to make this show as real as possible, they're also knowingly playing with our own meta fictions. You know, I think they could go maybe a little too far with this, which they never do. But let's say if they mentioned Brookside, for example, which Ricky and Sue were like the lead couple in, that to me would be a little too egregious. But this fast show, this Vicar Dibley reference, I, I just love it. I just think it's so smart. And The Vicar of Dibley, well, The Vicar of Dibley is a British sitcom which originally ran on BBC One from the 10th of November 94 to the 1st of Jan 2000, and then intermittently from Christmas Day 2004 to the 23rd of December 2020. It is set in a fictional small Oxfordshire village called Dibley, which is assigned a female vicar following the 1992 changes in Church of England that permitted the ordination of women. In ratings terms, it is among the most successful British programmes in the digital era, with the Christmas and New Year specials entering the UK top 10 programmes of that year. The Vicar of Dibley received multiple British comedy awards, two international Emmys, and placed third in a BBC poll of Britain's best sitcoms. I mean, third! It's a good show. It's a funny show, Vicar Dibley. I don't, you know, I prefer Father Ted if we're talking about religious comedies or whatever, but third, that seems really high. I bet it beat out the Royal Family as well. And Liz Smith in the show. Well, Liz Smith is Letitia Cropley in seven episodes, all in the first series. Letitia Cropley was a parish council member, a ranger of the church flowers, and a Dibley church organist. Geraldine once referred to her as the Queen of Cordon Bleu, and David Horton calls her the Dibley Poisoner. She was the creator of such revolting delicacies as bread and butter pudding surprise, which was a recipe for breeding snails, marmite cake, orange cake with Branston pickle icing, parsnip brownies, <laughs> plain pancakes with just a hint of liver, and chocolate spread sandwiches made with cod. I will say as well, personally, I have had a little bit of interaction with the Vicar of Dibley cast. Um, Clive Mantle, he's like, he's like David's brother. He's like very sort of sexy, you know, kind of early 50s dude that Geraldine really falls for. And there's that famous moment of her jumping in the puddle. That He's the boyfriend there, you know, he's the one there. And I used to work in audiobooks a few years ago, and Clive Mantle came in, and he's actually written some kids' books, and I recorded them with him. I basically recorded it. It was... The Jewel in the Nile of the Sands of Time or something like that. It was kind of like an Indiana Jones kids adventure ever. And he was a great guy. He was great to speak to, really, really friendly, and was in Game of Thrones as well. So it's like, wow. And finally, Dawn French. Well, Dawn Roma French, born October 1957, is a British actress, comedian, presenter, and writer. French is known for writing and starring on the BBC comedy show French and Saunders with her best friend and comedy partner Jennifer Saunders, as well as playing the lead role of Geraldine Granger in the BBC sitcom The Vicar of Dibley. Jim, though, doesn't want Dibley. Fancies only fools and horses. But the Radio Times is upstairs as Norma left it there when she was trying. Jim doesn't get irritated. I guess he'll be up there soon enough himself, rather proudly declaring to Dave that he had a Christmas log up there earlier. It's Christmas Day, Denise says, knowing how a dad can be, to which he replies, Christmas Day, my arse, which is, which is kind of exactly what he'd just been speaking of, to be fair. And Only Fools and Horses, British TV sitcom created and written by John Sullivan. And I mean, I, I'm a huge fan of the show, and I can't believe that one man wrote every single episode. I mean, John Sullivan is an underappreciated genius in my eyes. Like, I know that people love John Sullivan and stuff like that, but I don't really think he gets his due as much. Seven series were originally broadcast on BBC One in the UK from 81 to 91, with 16 sporadic Christmas specials aired until the end of the show in 2003. Set in working class Peckham in South East London, it stars David Jason as Del Boy Trotter, Nicholas Lindhurst as his younger brother Rodney, alongside a supporting cast. Critically and popularly acclaimed, the series received numerous awards, including recognition from BAFTA, the NTAs and the Royal Television Society, as well as winning individual accolades for both Sullivan and Jason. It was voted Britain's best sitcom in the 2004 BBC poll. The show, though, was not an immediate hit with viewers and received little promotion early on, but later achieved consistently high ratings, and the 1996 episode Time on Our Hands, originally billed as the last episode, which in my eyes it really should have been, holds the record for the highest UK audience for a sitcom episode, attracting 24.3 million viewers. Norma asks them when dinner tomorrow is going to be on Boxing Day. It's going to be around 3, Barb says, but Norma says she'll come for noon, just to be on the safe side. Jim obviously shaking his head ruefully at this. I mean, all it is is cold turkey and chips, but what a classic. Norma says lovely and then instantly clarifies that she doesn't want any turkey. But I mean, chips aren't bad on their own, you know. And we're going to see in season three how the royals get so excited for chippies. And quite rightly too. There's another breaking proceedings then. Silence from the cast for a second. We just see the newlyweds and mother and daughter lounging. The fanfare of the snowman show continuing. And Barbara then suddenly pops up with a, ooh, there's some sausage rolls left, she says. She could heat them up. Something she does multiple times in the bakery, I'm sure. The turkey sandwiches weren't greeted with any enthusiasms, and these rolls kind of get the same treatment with no one interested. She just wants people happy, Barb. People fed. She urges Anthony to have another celebration out of nowhere, but he's fine. I guess he doesn't want to ruin his appetite for the nut roast. And that kind of reminds me of how she accosted him with the wagon wheel for Emma in the last episode. 
Norma then jerks up and shoves Barb slightly, seemingly a little intoxicated. She doesn't want a chocolate or a sausage roll, rather she wants that classic nana snack of a date. Specifically, eat me dates, which are apparently a Christmas classic according to a few threads I've seen. Nana chortles at the brand name, asking how they think them up. I mean, it's hardly dibbly, but it has a chuckling nonetheless. So Nana gets scoffing on her dates, and Anthony announces leaving for his date, you know, in a way. He's not taking any presents either. Emma has already gotten hers, and Barb offers to wrap some roses up in a bag, which is kind, but again kind of underscores the financial distinctions between the two families. And Anthony smartly declines this. He then goes over to date-chomping Nana and kisses her goodbye on the cheek. She kisses and puckers her lips out as she does, which again is something my Nan would definitely do, probably yours too as well. Ant thanks Nana for the record token gift, which adds to the appearance that Ant is a music guy, what with the stereophonic CD for his 18th, the managing of Exit, etc. Jim looks dismissively at Anthony as he says his farewells to Nana, which is particularly mean, really. I mean, you might not like Norma, but do you begrudge her a kiss from her only grandson? Denise asks Ant as he grabs his coat if he's going to tell Emma he loves her tonight. And there's a fun bit of sibling teasing here with everyone in concurrence. Hey, Anthony. Are you going to tell Emma tonight that you love her? (laughs) You do love her. You love her. You do. You love her. You do. (laughs) And Jim naturally doesn't say any kind parting words, no advice, no good luck or anything. Rather does a little charade of his own that climaxes in love on the doll. Again, Jim really kind of attacking himself here for all of his criticisms of his son. Ricky's acting here is sublime, though. You know, he's a real captivating physical actor throughout the show, and in this moment in particular, you know, it gets a few laughs. Jim points at him as he pushes his crinkle nose inward, and flashes some hand signals to him. Kind of looks like Ronnie James Dio's horns, but he plays back, basically. Says goodbye to everyone, calls Denise tubby, but in a teasing, joking way, and then leaves the stage, as it were, with the closing of the door. I mean, how did he find out about Denise, I wonder? Was he dragged out of Emma's? I guess someone maybe could have got word, but maybe not. I mean, mobiles weren't as ubiquitous back then. It's never established, and something I'd never really considered before putting this episode together. Upon Anthony leaving, Barb scolds Jim mildly, but he says it's only a bit of practice for after the nut roast. I mean, a roast for a roast, I suppose. We didn't get to see the gift-giving ceremony that is part and parcel of a Christmas morning, but we hear lots about it still. We hear Norma revealing that Anthony got her some stuff from the body shop. And in a classic nanaism, Norma worries about the product not being tested on animals. But maybe not in the way you'd thought she'd go. You know, you thought she'd be like, oh, this is unsafe, you know, or who cares about the animals. But rather, it's, what if it fell onto a dog? I mean, what an absurd thing to imagine, you know, thinking that your fancy shower gel or cream might somehow land on old Rex and hurt him. I mean, oh, bless her. You know, you got to love Norma here. Norma who didn't want to say anything as it wasn't his fault. Barbara just sort of shrugs internally to this. You know, it kind of makes me wish we saw this scene of her unwrapping it and maybe Jim could have a go at her for her stupidity. And The Body Shop, The Body Shop International Limited, which trades as The Body Shop, is a British cosmetic skincare and perfume company. Founded in 1976 by Dame Anita Roddick, the company currently has a range of 1,000 products sold in about 3,000 stores, divided between those owned by the company and franchise outlets in more than 65 countries. And Anthony's really becoming a man then, it seems, at this point. This is the first time, Denise says, that she's ever got anything from him for Christmas, which is typical of being at that age, really. But yeah, maybe Emma is really good for him, as Barb says. Perhaps it was Emma's guiding hand too in the gifts, getting Nana the body shop stuff and Denise the Delia Smith cookery book. Something, of course, that will never get used. I mean, Jim knows this. Jokes about the possibility of coriander now being added to the Dairy Lee. And Delia Smith we have spoken about before. I mean, in the first episode of this series, Jim says Delia's got nothing to worry about when Denise says she made Dave Dairy Lee on toast for dinner. Jim, you know, he knows he shouldn't constantly joke. He says that he knows it's Christmas. And behind him, we can see that old school Tesco's own brand bottle of lemonade. You know the kind I'm talking about with the blue stripes against the white and the red. It's classic and now kitchen ironic when they use it on campaigns rather than just tired like it is here. And if you're into, like, the old cultural packaging of your... I forget the name of the Twitter account itself, but if you just search, like, Sainsbury's labels or something, there is someone out there just posting, like, what old Sainsbury's labels used to look like in the 70s. And if you're an anorak like me, hell, if you listen to the Royal Ramble, you might be interested. And yet again, Jim is not the Jim we saw at the end of Barbara's Finally Had Enough. This is the Jim of time. You know, this is the Jim we all know. And so when Denise says that she loves the gloves that Jim got her, you already know that he didn't actually get her. Uh, I love them gloves what Dad bought you, man. Yeah, well, he didn't actually buy them for me. I bought them. 
and unwrapped them. But he did write the tag. And this is seemingly a victory for Barb, something that warms her. Denise coos appreciatively too. I bet he made a big hassle to write the tag as well. This scene reminds me a bit of series one when Barb speaks about buying Mary's present off Joe for him. I mean, the men in this show really are hopeless, aren't they? Nana then needs to be mothered, doesn't know what to do with the date stone, so wraps it into a sweetie wrapper and then goes to put it back in, but Barbara grabs it and just throws it on the table. Jim looks a little disgusted, he clearly wants Nana out of here. So he comes up with a plan, plays Norma like a fiddle. A reminder of old Elsie at the flats on her own all day. I must go to her, Norma says. Jim smiles to himself, happy. A lift is offered by Dave, who then retires to himself on his snowball. Jim, though, gets coughing to urge her away. Dave gets up. Norma rises with effort. Denise tries to push her up without doing really anything, like we saw in Sunday dinner, but at least she's given a little bit of help. Jim gives the thumbs up to Dave off screen, and Nana dodders about, wanting to keep the hat, thinking that Elsie will like it, what with being housebound. Another hat is offered for Norma to take, but a cracker is denied, you know. She's very weak, apparently, though supposedly she would like one of the toys. It doesn't sound good for Elsie, does it? Housebound and eggbound, which is a phrase I hadn't heard before. I mean, it means bunged up, fecally challenged, if you will. So egg binding occurs in animals, such as reptiles or birds, when an egg takes longer than usual to pass out the reproductive tract. So Dave then re-enters the scene, rocking the moped helmet in a comical flash of yellow. A helmet is then passed to Norma off-screen, and the camera whips back to show Norma now with the black helmet on, as Barb passes her across some cold turkey, her presents, and the rest. So... Dave didn't get rid of the old fizzy then. We know that he has a van. He took Nana back in it last series. But what are they riding there? I mean, maybe Twiggy just hasn't came round yet. You know, and the concept of Nana getting on the back of all of those things, with all her Christmas flotsam and jetsam, no less, is a wild image. I'm surprised she's game. I mean, she's an able lass, Norma. You've got to give her that. Elsie certainly wouldn't get up there with Dave. Nana is always money orientated, like Jim, however. Grateful that the presents can be exchanged. Now all your presents are in there. Oh, thanks. Hey, and thanks for getting them all from Marx's. I can take them back when they have a sale and get twice as much. Mm. (laughs) Oh, bye-bye, love. It really is the thought that counts, ain't it? Denise gets a kiss on the cheek, thanks Nana for her boots voucher, Norma tells Jim she circled what she wants taped in the Radio Times, and Dave says he won't be long. Jim then states with cross fingers for them to be careful and doesn't want them falling off. Denise laughing as he adds in a prayer and thumbs aloft. So they leave, and as they pass, we can see another big Christmas card on the wall, similar to Anthony's bang on the door card. The moped can be heard whirring away in the background. And Barbara comments on how long the day is, Christmas Day, which they've conveyed perfectly here, the aftermath and the the lived-in nature of the room. Denise smiles to herself then, imagining Nana and Elsie in their hats. Barbara sees the sweetness in it too. When you're that age, all you need is someone there to nod off with. Jim sees the truth in it though, possibly. She's only gone over there to save on a gas bill. I mean, both things can be true at the same time. Denise then says she has to go to the loo, which we know has made Jim explode before over her slowness. Denise staggers off screen in an ungainly manner. Jim calls her Vanessa, obviously a reference to Vanessa Feltz, who he's commented on before on TV, saying that she's a big girl, her. There's a wild fanfare on the screen as Denise leaves, announcing her departure. And Jim then comments, of course, conveying it in rectal terms, that he's as full as a bull's bum. After all that rich food, he wants something light for his dinner, and of course, he ain't going to do it himself, rather detailing to Barb that he wants eggs and soldiers with the crust cut off. Which, you know, is a personal peeve for me, really, and I'm surprised it bothers Jim. Crusts are like the best bit. If you don't like crusts on your sandwiches, grow up. (laughs) So eggs and soldiers, I mean, the soldier being a thin strip of bread, the strips that, you know, toast sort of sliced in a manner so it can be dipped into a soft-boiled egg that has the top removed. Apparently in 2005, the Daily Telegraph reported the invention of a device for cutting bread into actual soldiers. And in terms of the history, the specific term, eggs with soldiers, appears to date only from the 1960s. The modern phrase first appeared in print in 1966 in Nicholas Freeling's novel The Dresden Green, where it's used to eat soup. It is possible that it was either popularised or invented in 1965 in a series of TV commercials for eggs starring Tony Hancock and Patricia Hayes. And Hancock is someone that I really need to get into. I mean, he's a Brummie, no less, like myself. There is a great statue of him in our city. But um, I think it's on the front of the script of series one of the Royal Family. It says, like, Tony Hancock couldn't have imagined a more perfect sitcom. And, like, you know, I need to just watch all of these Hancock half hours and listen to them because what I have heard, I really, really like. So Barb collects herself, right, she says, absently, then remembers that alongside the eggs and soldiers and everything else, she's got all that horrible washing up to do, which isn't going to do itself, Jim says, who has added to it now with his demanded dinner. 
Jim flicks off the Snowman production. Doesn't seem to be much on. Flicks it back on, then asks Barb to grab the radio times from upstairs, resting the remote on his unenviable paunch. The playful music returns. Barbara calls up the stairs to Venice, who calls back down asking for her, clearly distraught. Though the show doesn't want to show too much emotion here straight away, cutting right back from this to Jim, who raises his leg and trumps with great effort, fanning his self-made miasma away from him, using the remote even. And then suddenly we cut, and we're upstairs somewhere entirely new, a place that has only been hinted at before, the royal family bathroom. Which is kind of how you imagine it, really. Tired walls, toothbrushes on the sink, a sink that wouldn't look out of place in a prison cell of sorts. But it's Denise, of course, that is the focus here. And it seems like the baby's coming. Denise? Ma, will you come up? And water breaking? Well, while inside the uterus, the baby's enclosed in a fluid-filled membrane called the amniotic sac. Shortly before, at the beginning or during labour, the sac ruptures. Once the sac ruptures, termed the water breaks, the baby's at risk for infection, and the mother's medical team will assess the need to induce labour if it has not started from the time they believe to be safe for the infant. Barbara is unflappable, just what you want in this situation. Quickly realises what is happening, says they can ring Dave on the mobile, but of course Denise has the mobile, so they'll ring the hospital. Denise, who seems a wreck here, not excited like some would be, but clearly scared of the unknown before her. Jim, Barbara screams in that way of hers, like we heard when she called for him from upstairs when Dave was threatening to drink drive after him and Denise's argument, and wow, that really does feel like, uh, well, half a world away at this point, doesn't it? Barbara urges Jim upstairs, goes downstairs, urges him upstairs as the waters have broken. Jim, though, is stationary at first. Clearly doesn't mishear her, but still says the water have broken. Barbara is like we've never seen her before, and how she should be more, to be honest. Urgent, undeviating. She rouses Jim, slaps his head, shoves a CD player in his lap with the tape, and he gets up quick, still able to part a few shots, you know, asking, is this the damn busters? And, and Dave would have been here if it wasn't for your mother, etc. I mean, he's always got to make it back Norma. And the damn busters, well, also known as Operation Chastis, was an attack on German dams carried out on the night of 16th to the 17th of May, 1943, by the 617 Squadron RAF Bomber Command, later called the Dam Busters, using special bouncing bombs developed by Barnes Wallace where two hydroelectric power stations were destroyed and several more damages, and factories and mines were also damaged and destroyed. An estimated 1,600 civilians and about 600 Germans and 1,000 forced labourers, mainly Soviet, were killed by the flooding. A 1955 film, The Dam Busters, was made about the raids and was very popular. Its depiction of the raid, along with a similar sequence in the film 633 Squadron, provided the inspiration for the Death Star trench run in Star Wars A New Hope. The film is also watched on television by the character Pink in the 1982 film Pink Floyd The Wall. Now, what Jim is referring to here in terms of the song, you hear him sing it a bit later, the Dan Busters March, is the theme to the film. The musical composition by Eric Coates has achieved the distinction of becoming synonymous with both the film and the real operation, and the Dan Busters March remains a very popular accompaniment to fly past in the UK. Progressive rock band Jeffro Tull were known to conclude their concerts in the late 70s and early 80s with a rock rendition of the theme, and it can be heard on their 1978 live album, Bursting Out. On the 1st of September 2006, it was announced that Peter Jackson would produce a remake a 1955 movie to be directed by Christian Rivers. As of January 2020, production has not started. So Jim sings the Dan Busters theme as he goes upstairs, and the camera changes to a now seemingly empty bathroom. Lots of classic stuff we can see here, a bag of cotton balls secured to the tap, an overflowing laundry basket, a rack of soaps and gels atop the green bath, or a scale sits underneath a bottle of bleach. Jim announces himself, and we can see Denise on the floor, seated. And here's something I discovered, and I don't know, like, if I'm the first person to see this, probably not. But it, I couldn't find anything else about this online. You can see the cameraman. So go to this scene. Go to, like, the final five minutes of this episode. Go to the moment, literally, when Jim comes into the bathroom. And there's kind of a mirror. Essentially where the camera would be, kind of, like, facing the camera. And my eyes were on that mirror. Because I just thought, okay, maybe I'll catch something in there. And, yeah, you can see something, basically. There's obviously one camera guy in there. And you can just spot him. You can just spot him for, like, one or two seconds. I put it on the Twitter, uh, at Royal Ramble Pod. So scroll back through the Twitter. And I'll repost it when I put this episode up on the main feed. But, um, yeah, kind of like a, you know, kind of like a, like, oopsie there or whatever. But still very endearing. I, I kind of like that. And the cameraman himself has actually been revealed. So Ricky would speak about this scene many years later, saying... So this is from... 
And Ricky would speak about this scene many years later, and this is from the article. Quote, The moment filming with Caroline felt particularly powerful to Ricky for two reasons. Quote, I think it was so special to her because she didn't have children, said Ricky. And it was so special to me because my own girl, my Kate, was born on Christmas Day. And that's why the tears were real. The cameraman was a son of Corrie character Stan Ogden. And at the end, he was crying too and said, that's it. We don't need another take. It just stands out in my mind. And Caroline is a genius at cry acting. And you've got to think, she really didn't do much drama before this at all, I don't think. Jim asks what the matter. Denise looks bereft, laments that she can't remember stuff from the baby book. She's supposed to be doing her breathing. Jim reassures her, sits beside her, hugs her. She smiles warmly and Jim pops on the baby tape in the yellow player. They sit together for a second, let the music soak in. The camera angle is fantastic as it's kind of beneath them, helping us really feel grounded. Denise sniffs. There's a nice patient moment. I mean, you know, the royal family has really languished in all these silences for so long, but here they're doing it in a completely different paradigm, you know. We can also see the bathroom mat rolled up beside them. And then Jim gets asking the real questions. Denise. Yeah. Are you definitely sure it wasn't just a great big piss, love? No, I know it wasn't. Of course he doesn't think that, but, you know, still trying to reassure. And it's a royal family tradition, seemingly, at this point, isn't it? End the series at hand, with Denise feeling terrified about life, and Jim being there to reassure her. I mean, we saw that in series one as they left for the church, and now Denise wonders if she even wants the baby. Doesn't think Dave wants it either, as he didn't go to feel for the kicks. Jim, we can see, as he's listening, is properly teary-eyed, moved by his daughter and the prospect of impending grandfatherhood too, perhaps. And man, this... I mean, I'm, I'm choking up now, even doing this. This part of the scene always floors me. Jim, you know, barely able to speak, remembering Denise's birth. How do you remember the first time your mum... When your mum put, put you in my arm and I looked at you... Oh, God, you were beautiful, and I knew, I I knew then, I'd do anything for you, anything for you, and our Anthony. His voice there, you know, saying that he'd do anything for, and our Anthony as well, which is nice that he's added in, our Anthony. And Denise gets to the heart of the matter after this, in quite devastating fashion, I've always felt. What if I'm not a good mom like me, ma'am, she asks. Well, she won't be, actually, will she? I mean, that's the truth of it. And Denise obviously knows this, having grown up around someone skilled enough to maintain a home amongst Jim and his ways. Denise seems convinced that Dave won't come back, but of course, she's in a heightened state. She is like a little kid at this point, urging Jim to promise like a child, you know, requiring reassurance. Denise puts her head on his shoulder. She wipes his eyes. He says he's going to be a granddad. Another song then plays. And wow, Cheryl really sequences this tape well. I've got to give it to her. Barbara comes up, comes in, she's called a taxi, Jim wipes his eyes, and still can't not be Jim, of course, decrying it being double fair on Christmas Day, you know. Everyone leaves. Barbara goes first, helping her down. You know, don't slip on this carpet with no shoes on your little feet, she says. Everyone reverting back now into their old roles of parent and child, you know. Jim and Barb with Lil Denise. Jim is behind on the stairs, helping, holding the stereo. A contraction seems to flare for Denise, who exhales with Jim at her back, mirroring, needing the calmness himself, I'm sure, as well in his breaths. Dave enters, gawping in shock. Denise fires off at him. Barb says she might give birth on Christmas Day, which, yeah, I mean, there's a few hours left, you know. The taxi bibs outside and Barb gets the troops together. Dave, by the way, who seemed uninterested then, still with his helmet on, goes over to Denise, tells that he loves her. She likes that. He kisses her with the helmet on. It, it's just wonderful. And then Dave goes off outside. Not waiting for Denise, seemingly. Not, not accompanying her. Jim switches all the lights off, shuts the door to the lounge. We can see the cards hanging and the silhouettes passing. And Jim can't help but get a little joking at the end. Still rocking his Christmas hat. And then, kind of like at the end of the first series as well, a song plays and we pan along, and we pan across the household with none of the roles in it. Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas is played, and we can appreciate here some of the weirder items as well as the photos we've seen before. You know, the wedding photo's still there, uh, a nativity scene in the back with the tree, some of the other items as well as the photos that we've seen before. You know, the wedding photos are still there, there's a nativity scene in the back along with the tree. This is a scene that the camera, the nativity scene, seems to hover on for a moment before we climb to the star on top of the tree, which is charmingly made of tinfoil. And the credits then roll on top of this image rather than it being cut to black with. Noel Gallagher singing. It's a tasteful ending to 
an emotional masterpiece of a Christmas episode. And there you have it, guys. So, again, if you enjoy the show, you want to give back, you can email us, therawramblepod at gmail.com, uh, Twitter at the Raw Ramble Pod. we'll put all the links down below, iTunes, leave a review, YouTube, Spotify, we're all over the place. And if you really, really enjoy the show and you just can't wait and you want to listen to the next episode now, which at the time of this recording is Hello Baby David, the opener to season three, then uh, you can support on Patreon. And, again, the link is down below. Much, much appreciated. But until next time, I'll see you next month take it easy tom quee presents the royal ramble an episode by episode celebration of the classic british sitcom the royal family to get in touch with the show email us at the royal ramble pod at gmail.com